the leverage due to the supply is really going to be on your side this year. Clint Berry, marketing rep for Superior Livestock, joins us today as we work through the cattle facts projections for 2024. The U.S. beef cattle herd is the smallest since 1961, and expansion of the U.S. herd appears to be rather slow. I think interest has played a bigger part in that decision-making process than what it has in probably a decade and a half or longer. We'll talk through some of the fundamentals from corn and hay prices to consumer demand. You know, how much more can we put on it and still satisfy the American consumer's budget and keep that demand there. Then we'll break down the reports as we look at projected prices from fat cattle down through feeder steers and calves, as well as the cold cow market and the bread cattle market. That's all on today's episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Hi, everyone. This is the Working Ranch Radio Show. I'm Justin Mills. We're glad to have you joining us on our program today. As you heard there in the opening, we're going to be reviewing and looking through the projections of the 2024 Cattle Facts Report that came out at the industry convention that took place down in Orlando. Clint Berry joining us on that. We'll be getting into that in just a few moments. But before we do that, I did want to let you know later on in the show, we're going to have also another guest joining us, Dr. Travis White with Saskatoon Colostrum Company as we talk about that that element of our cow calf and our mama cows out there and those calves the need for that liquid gold that I call it that comes with those mama cows when they have calves and uh, he's going to be joining us to talk a little bit more about that as well also don't forget meteorologist Don Day will be in with a look at our long-term weather and the captain Tim O'Byrne also stepping in for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents so just to let you know what's all in store for this week's program now as we turn towards our show I'm pleased to have back with us Mr. Clint Berry he is a Mark marketing rep for Superior Livestock. And Clint, glad to have you joining us back here again on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Hey, thank you, Justin. Always a pleasure to tune in and, and get a chance to visit. Well, I'm glad you can join us as you were and I were visiting before we went on air. I know you're in Kentucky right now. You had a set of calves to ship out, but I also know you've uh, made the big move back to your home country of San Angelo, Texas, and quite happy about that. Yep. Yeah. I get a chance to get back closer to my, my mom's side of the family and and uh, their home ranch there, they're just about, uh, just right up the road, about 75 miles or so. <laughs> In Texas, we always just say, uh, you know, about an hour or so away is all they are. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's close. Everything's relative. <laughs> yeah, that's close. Well, let's jump into this. Uh, you and I, a year ago, we did the same thing. We just kind of rehashed a little bit of the information that's come out here at the front part of the year between Cattle Facts and the USDA. In fact, the USDA just kicking out their inventory report the first part of this month. Cattle Facts also at the recent CattleCon convention down in Orlando, they gave their presentation as far as what they expect for numbers to be this year. Let's jump right into this and look first at the cattle cycle. And we're at this point right now where we're still in a rebuilding phase and we continue to see that. And I know probably as you saw cattle and calves shipping and and seeing what's out there, still going to see these numbers drop a little bit as folks selling off and maybe not retaining as many heifers, maybe starting that process. But what are you saying? Yeah, I I would agree with that. You know, and like you said, we, we looked at these numbers last year and obviously hindsight 2020 we probably weren't aggressive enough in our in our projections from last year's market but as we said here this year and i I really thought this fall you'd start to see some pressure on the bread stock market meaning you know young bread cows replacement heifers bread open heifer or bread heifers or open heifers either one but you know we really never saw that last year The, the feeder value on them females were enough and there just wasn't enough pressure to differentiate those heifers in the marketplace you could tell there just wasn't a lot of replacement value on them and I was surprised because I thought we would turn that engine on the last fall, you know, somewhere maybe December, January of this year, uh, maybe late November, December of last year. And it just didn't happen. Mm-hmm. And that's a clear sign that we are not rebuilding numbers, you know, after we've had one of the biggest cow kills in yeah. the last couple of years here rolling for us. And 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 that's tough, just kind of stomach to, to think that, you know, we're not rebuilding the cow herd, but it's also – you know, on the optimistic side, it's also a, a, a clear indication that this cycle is going to last a little bit longer because we haven't started that process to build back. And we may never build back to the cow numbers that we once had, but but we will certainly turn that crank and start adding some heifers back. But, boy, it's been slow to come right now. There's just not been any replacement pressure value 
in the marketplace as we currently stand. Yeah, and towards the tail of our conversation today, we'll, I want to go back to this and we'll look a little bit more as far as where we see this cycle, the length of this cycle going to be. Because what I'm noticing, too, is that when we look, a lot of times there's always a lot of comparison over previous cattle cycles. One of the things that we're seeing in this is people are, are kind of slow in keeping some of these heifers back. Maybe it's an indication of where the interest rates are at. Also, maybe some things that we went through with coming out of years of drought in much of the country, and it's pretty slow. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think I think interest has played a bigger part in that decision-making process than what it has in probably a decade and a half or longer, folks. You know, that's that's a twofold deal. Not only is it the interest rate on what you may purchase, but it's the fact that no matter what part of the country you're in, the last two or three years, all of us have struggled in some form or fashion with weather conditions, drought conditions, whatever it's been. And our operating notes have gotten higher in a lot of positions. And that interest on those have been bad. And I know a lot of the customers that that sold their calves this year were counting on collecting their first really solid uh, higher market paycheck. And a lot of them got sound on their bottom line. You know, they mm-hmm. they eliminated a lot of red on that bottom line and got squared up before they were going to be interested in reinvesting, regardless of what that was, if it was machinery or improvements or cattle, a lot of them wanted to square a lot of that up. And, and I think they've been a little slow coming back out the gate and I'm going to attribute that to interest. I mean, I can tell you, I feed some cattle and my interest rate in the same feed yard barn from the same bank is is about 45 percent higher than it was, you know, two years ago. Yeah. And that's that's a cost that's that eat that adds up and eats into that profit line. Yeah. Let's switch gears just a bit. Let's talk about fed slaughter capacity. Something that I would thought was an interesting graph when I saw this was that 2023 was the first year since 2015 where we had enough hook space to match the amount of cattle to slaughter. And prior to that, we were way producing way over the shackle space. And we've, you and I, we've talked about this before, but now we're starting to see that match up a little bit that's got to be very helpful to give us some leverage as a producer i'd guess yeah that's right that's right we're we, we've swung that pendulum back and you know think how much we've talked about especially since the COVID era but think how much we've talked about trying to add hook space to to better line this industry into being more efficient and having the ability to kill the cattle that we've got produced plus the other side of that, not only have we added and, and, and are still in the process of adding, of course, a lot of the big plants that we're talking about haven't actually come online yet, at least not in full force. But, you know, having having fewer animals there is that way, too. Like I said, it's it's a catch 22 a little bit. It's mm-hmm. when 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 we're dealing with smaller numbers, it's tough because you hate to see the industry shrinking. But for all of us that stay in you know, that only increases the value of the animals that are there. And it's kind of a double-edged sword in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. We're going to take a break here, Clint. When we come back, we're going to we're going to jump more into some numbers, some inventory numbers, as well as market outlook numbers. That's what our focus is here today as our my guest is Clint Berry with Superior Livestock. He uh, joins us a couple times throughout the years. We always rehash the markets a little bit here. With, he's with us today as we talk about our inventory numbers and some of the projections that we're seeing ahead for 2024 and beyond. We're going to continue when we come back here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. This segment today brought to you by Diamond V Natural Immune Support Postbiotic Feed Additives because your animal's health deserves a healthier approach. Find out more at diamondv.com. We'll be back after this. When your goal is to help animals reach their full potential, health matters. Diamond V offers a fresh perspective on animal health, a perspective that supports gut health, strengthens immunity, and enhances performance. For those who choose to invest in keeping healthy animals healthy, feeding Diamond V makes a statement about another dimension of profit, where margins are measured by confidence in your future. To get a fresh perspective, visit DiamondV.com, because animal health deserves a healthier approach. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. As we continue on, my guest today is Clint Berry with Superior Livestock. As we were talking just in general, some of the outlooks that have been projected both by the USDA as well as cattle facts regarding some of the numbers for this coming year. 
it's always at this time of the year. I know for a lot of folks, they're just kind of figuring out things, trying to figure out what you know where this calf market's going to be at, where this yearling market's going to be at, and the bread market. We're going to talk about that in a bit. But before we get to that, Clint, uh, you talked a little bit in the last segment about the fact that you've uh, fed cattle for several years. Let's quickly look at the corn outlook. Cattle facts projecting that this market for the corn market could come down just a little bit, being around averaging in 2024, around five dollars a bushel, and that's got to be some incentive too. If we can put, uh, if the price of to gain uh, cost of gain, they expect to be around a dollar ten to a dollar thirty, but the price of fed to be around dollar seventy to dollar seventy five. If you do your math, there's some incentive there that this uh, fed market should stay solid. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, and it's been nice. You know, this year our cost of gains are down as compared to the past year, and that 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 cost of corn has cheapened up throughout the entire year. Now, corn farmers may not want to hear that, but yeah. us on the livestock industry <laughs> side, it was sure a blessing because, uh, well, I can tell you every position I took on corn last year was the wrong one, yeah. which means moved in the right direction. That's what that means. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's one of the things they talked about. So there's going to be some incentive. We might see some heavier carcass weights. Now, let's look on the rancher yeah. side of this. And, and when we start talking hay outlook, because the corn outlook, I definitely, I mean, I know there's guys that retain cattle. And of course, it does affect us as, as ranchers that maybe don't retain cattle, what the price of corn is. But what directly affects a lot of ranchers would be the cost of hay. And we also, we look at this hay outlook. We do know in 2021 and 22, boy, I tell you, the supplies were tight with drought 2023, even maybe uh, not as tight and prices are down a bit. But projections for 2024 is these these prices come down another $30 a ton and around $185 a ton, which I still think is ridiculously expensive. But nevertheless, that's going to be positive to helping, uh, you know, the bottom line in general. Yeah, that and and a good indicator of of the change in the weather pattern that's that's helping us with that production. You know, for two or three years prior to last year, there there wasn't a part in the country that wasn't struggling with forage production in some form or fashion. Last year was the first year that a large majority of the country was was blessed with excess hay and uh, and forage, and that was that was a good thing. And and so when you see that. And, and even though, like you said, it may seem like it's still going to be a little high as compared to normal, but we've also got to adjust and remember fertilizer and fuel costs are higher than what we would call normal, too. If in comparison, marginally wise, that, that's that's pretty much staying in line. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let's get into the market outlook and let's start on our feeder steers. Uh, we talked about it just a little bit ago when we were addressing where the corn market was going to be at for the year. And in 2023, the average price on fed steers was $1.75 a pound. This year, they're projecting that up to be about nine cents higher at about a buck eighty-four a pound. Those are just amazing prices in itself. Yeah, they are. You know, we've not seen prices like that for uh, you know since the big the big push back in the in 14 or so. Mm-hmm. But uh, you know, and and here we are. That you know, projections in in the mid 180s, and we're there right now on the board. You know, we're, yeah. we're tickling it right yeah. now. So I, I don't think that's by any means out of line. You know, it may be a little bearish as compared to where we may end up, especially depending on what contract month you want to talk about. But on an average, yeah, that's and that's doable. And, and those prices need to be there because I can tell you there was a lot of buyers that bought those calves in 2023 that, that shipped in the fall of 23, especially those that were bought in the early summer during that big push when we had all those high prices. And those cattle, they were a little upside down on them cattle as to where the the projections were. So they need that that lower cost of gain and they need that increase on that fat market to make it square and profitable on the buyer side so that they can pour back into them calves again this year on behalf of the cow calf producer. It's, you know, this, this cycle's got to, got to, everybody's got to make a little money on, on every little segment. And, and uh, those kind of numbers are going to have to be there. And I, and I think if you look at the, like you were saying, if you look at the data and look at the head counts, it's going to be there. Mm-hmm. Um, my only question is, you know, how, how much, how much can we put on, you know, if most of the cattle that were sold last year were somewhere between 25 and 40% increase in value over a year. Mm-hmm. I think that's a pretty fair number depending on what you were selling and how you were selling them and, and all those kind of factors. But, you know, how much more can we put on it and still satisfy the American consumer's budget and keep that demand there? I, I think we're all going to 
figure that out over the course of the next couple of years here as to where that where that ceiling is or where that sweet spot is. Uh, you know, that's that's my only fear because the numbers say that cattle should increase in value. But but I've got to worry a little bit about will we continue to move the tonnage for the value in the grocery store with an economy faced with some challenges for the American consumer. Yeah. And I think that's a valid concern. I, that's always a concern when we see record high prices, we know down the road, that's going to affect something as well, mainly our consumer, our customers. Let's drop down to the feeder cattle of, or the feeder steers, the, the calves, uh, that 800 weight steer in 2023, the average price was $2 and 18 cents a pound this year. They're projecting a range anywhere from 220 to 260. I, hate giving ranges because i think that's uh there's a big difference there between 220 to 260 so if you settle at 240 uh on these feeder steers boy i'll tell you what uh, again some unprecedented numbers there that we're seeing as well yeah that's right and if you know you're right when you give those ranges of course the seller always hear the highest yeah. ones yeah and the buyer always hears the lowest <laughs> ones it's <laughs> yeah. a funny thing on that but <laughs> but yeah and if you look at the current markets on some of the top end cattle right now you threw out 240 as the round number. We're pretty close to that on an eight weight, especially with a good address. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we've we've sold several in the 30s, and and this week I heard reports of some in the in the 40s and 50s even. Some of them would be program calves to be up in the 50s right now, but I don't think that's out of line as to you know to where we're going. Um, and it and it makes sense in the big picture that, that makes sense with shorter numbers because those those feeder cattle you know they've got so much more value with that extra age on them and, and their hardiness that that yeah I, you mm-hmm. can see that market get pushed that way and don't you think clint that those that particular class of cattle is really susceptible immediately right here right now to where we're at moisture wise and drought conditions wise across the country that's exactly right. They've got shorter shorter time between now and harvest, you know, and that's one of the challenges or benefits, depending mm-hmm. on what, what side of the aisle you're on there. The other side of it is, you know, they've always got, by the time you get an animal to that size, you've pretty much eliminated all of the possible deads when it goes to feed. Mm-hmm. And that's that's another reason why they draw that kind of value. But yeah, yeah absolutely, it's more susceptible. Yeah, I think we can talk all the numbers we want to here today, but we do know that weather's going to play some effect. And so that's always the unknown out there. And to me, that's the class of cattle that if it's droughty in a place or in a location, you know, it's going to definitely affect those. Unfortunately, down in your part of the country, you guys have started to get a little rain this winter. So that might be helpful for you all. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, Compared to where we were a year ago, the the wheat pastures are better. We're we're not we're not, you know, fully healed and everything's not perfect, but it's a lot better off than what it was, and sure a lot better than what it what you know if we were talking this six months ago, mm-hmm. we were pretty nervous about where we were going to be. But yeah, you're you're exactly right there. Yeah, well, let's take another break here, Clint. When we come back, we're going to continue, folks. Uh, we've yet to get into the five uh, five hundred and fifty pound steers, wean steers. We're going to get into that plus the cold cow prices, bred female prices, and we'll wrap it all up with just where we think and how long this cycle is going to go as well. When we come back here on the Working Ranch Radio Show, this segment today brought to you by the American Gelvy Association. Make your crossbreeding count with Gelvy and Balancer Genetics. Find out more at Gelvy. We'll be back after this. Capitalize on crossbreeding with Gel V and Balancer Bulls. Raise replacement females with added fertility, increased longevity, and greater productivity. Gel V and Balancer influenced females wean more pounds of calf per cow exposed. In the feed yard, Balancer influenced cattle offer increased performance, improved feed efficiency, and had excellent carcass merit. Balancers add the pounds, make the grade, and deliver the value. Make your crossbreeding count with Gelb V and Balancer Genetics. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show as we continue on. We're just forward looking into 2024 where we expect these markets to be at. This is coming off of numbers from uh, Cattle Facts as they gave their recent information at the Cattle Convention down in Orlando. My guest today is Clint Berry with Superior Livestock. And Clint, before the break, we were starting to work our way through the different classes of cattle as far as prices and projections on that. We've got through most of the feeder cattle. We need to start back up now looking at these five and a half weight 
steers, wean steers they're going off of on prices. This last year, the average price on those wean steers was around two sixty one. This year, they project the prices to be around two dollars and ninety cents a pound for five and a half weight wean steers, and uh, that is is quite interesting. They expect that to peak in the spring and then maybe decrease through the through the fall run. Kind of some interesting prices there. Yeah, there is. Um, and, you know, that, that peaking in the spring and decreasing, you know, if you think about that, though, isn't that what it does nearly every year? Yeah. Whether we're in a $1 market or a $3 market, you know, when that fall run hits, we typically have a press a, a push down in, in pricing due to, due to the increased supply. But it's usually pretty hard to find a wean 550 weight calf in the fall. Yeah. I mean, they're either falling calves in the fall at that weight or they are a lot heavier than 550. Yeah. they've been weaned that long you know so uh yeah I, I those numbers make a lot of sense to me and i i would tell you they if we look back at last year and look at this year that that's probably going to be a little bearish but mm-hmm. you know maybe a little conservative there but yeah. uh, i think it's going to be an exciting time for for everybody in the cattle business but especially for farmers and ranchers they're you know the leverage due to the supply is really going to be on your side this year it's a great year to to, to be sure and capture all you can you know, and and keep the added values on those calves. You know, like you're talking about those wean calves, they're still going to be worth more than a balling calf is. Balling calf's going to be worth a lot of money, but a wean calf's going to be worth a whole lot more, just just like it. You know, standard most years. Mm-hmm. Well, and and I wondered about that as you. I was going to ask you this question because I I was wondering where really if we're going to see that on this upswing. Are we? Is it? Are you going to get that that return on your investment? I guess is my question to you. Yeah, and it you know that's that's always a little tough because the expense side of that is difficult for everybody, and it's got to be evaluated for each place. You know, what's one thing for you and your neighbor isn't always equal parts to that. You know, our data at Superior is going to show you that year in and year out, twenty years worth of third party data as a wing calf is always worth more than a ball and calf. Now there there'll be there'll be instances that that's incorrect. I'm not saying there's not, but if you look at the whole trend. You know, you look at our data from an entire year and it'll show a positive return on that. But what we run into is a little bit of perception versus reality. Mm-hmm. You have a year where these cattle spike in prices and and we see those numbers and they're outstanding. They're, you know, we're selling ball and calves more than we sold bean calves before. And, and so our mind can't help but go to the fact that we're not getting paid. You know, we're, they're making so much for those wean cattle, but but if you compare them to where the where the wean calves are and the balling calves, and, and part of that's going to be timing as always, but you know if you can put weight on weight gain on those ball on those on those calves and change them from a balling calf to a wean calf and add value that way, you're just going to have more buyers um, intensively looking at them because the one thing in agriculture that regardless of what segment you're in, labor is an issue, mm-hmm. and it, there isn't a feeder in the country that doesn't talk about how short and how how hard it is for them to have enough labor to take those calves from balling status into a weaned and a long weaned status. And it, it's, it's a real challenge in the feed yard to be able to handle that. Even in the runs when they're set up, you know, can you imagine trying to wean 10,000 balling calves in a feed yard? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and having the help to do that with it, it's, it's a difficult challenge. And I only think as we move forward, you're going to see more and more pressure on that. Yeah. If we go. And if you're talking about program calves, third party verified, program cattle the non-hormone naturals in particular is what i'm talking about those cattle when they're a wean status versus a ball and calf if they're getting put into confinement if they're going from the ranch into a calf fit scenario Mm -hmm. um, those wean cattle are worth a whole lot more Mm -hmm. because the fallout rate on those if they have to be doctored if they have to be treated with an antibiotic you know it just eliminates that that premium that they paid and it has to be spread across all of them and you see a lot of pressure there. That's why you see those program, third party program, natural cattle that are feeders bring the kind of money they do because most of that risk is gone. Yeah. So if, you know, if I'm a producer making that kind of product, I sure want to take advantage of the lean status. Yeah. If I, as long as I've got the forage base and the labor to handle it. 
You yeah. know, I mean, it's yeah. it's going to be different from everybody. Just make it work for you. Yeah, and I and I think that's a key thing. I think you really, as a producer, if you're if you're in a situation you got feed on hand or cheap feed or you're close to cheap feed, maybe something to consider. If you're a range guy out in the middle where it takes a hundred acres to run a cow, you may not be able to do that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's right. You're not you're not set up. That's not efficient. That's yep, right. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's jump through this here. Cold cow prices. You were talking about that just a little bit ago. This last year they averaged ninety eight cents a pound this year they're expecting those to be around a dollar 15 to a dollar 25 a pound and with it to peak in the summer months which is again normally is when it does uh from now through the summer months is when those cold cow prices will go and then lower back through into october and december not a big surprise there but those prices definitely are are real supportive for really cleaning up the herd yeah when you're when you're looking at eight nine ten percent interest on a cow that's not raising a very good calf and you can make that kind of return as a way up cow she looks pretty appetizing and you can understand why we've been killing so many cows recently Mm -hmm. so uh yeah and i that's just a blessing for the overall beef demand that we're seeing within the u.s i mean you know those cold cows make up the heart of the grind there and that's a prime indicator of the pressure there is on on that staple of the american diet you know being hamburger meat yeah and i i just i don't see that going away i only see that intensifying the moment we start to have some replacement value pressure you know dollar 20 that may be considerably too <laughs> bearish you yeah. know when we start to have if once you start to have some guys that are going to be willing to calve that cow out one more time around that aged cow or keep that keep that younger cow and roll her into a, maybe a fall cabin program or something mm-hmm. so i i just see that as a big upside going forward okay let's get into the bred females and i know this is kind of something that probably if there's anything that's been a little bit of a head scratcher a bit i mean they're strong and we see these bread markets even now they're starting to kick in even more a lot of these sale barns having having bread sales so we're starting to see that last year they were the bread female market was around twenty one hundred dollars a head this year they're expecting that to be twenty six hundred dollars a head and i think in some ways some folks also kind of backing up say man can i afford that how does that pencil out but that's kind of what they're expecting what do you think on that yeah and i I, once again i'm going to tell you if if in fact that we start to see that turn and and a pretty aggressive retention rate start to happen that's probably a conservative number on those cattle because i just i was fooled as as everybody was a lot of folks we assumed that as we moved into the fall we were going to see that that start that kind of pressure and i just gotta imagine that that has more to do with outside factors than the internal fundamentals yeah because internally when we're selling calves for what we did in 2023 and what we're going to sell them for in 2024 that would entice people to to increase cow numbers yeah but the outside factors this economy is slowing that down and i i just think that a good young bred animal is going to be worth a heck of a lot of money i I hate to you know i mean we saw some record prices in the 13 14 era yeah and i'm not saying we might get that high but we're gonna we're gonna tickle and challenge that spot that's for sure well and i think as you said if some of those outside factors can soften a bit if the feds actually do decrease uh, interest rates by two to two and a half percent which they're saying they might do in the 2024 it might lighten that up a bit a little bit because cattle fax runs you through a, a bread heifer calculator and on average they say on an average normal just throughout the years of of, of history with the cow cow herd it takes four and a half to five calves to pay for for a, a bread heifer and you know when you take those numbers in 2023 and bread heifers were averaging twenty five hundred dollars a head it took three calves to pay for that cow if you take the prices that we're in now and and where they could be at i mean we could see if they do the calculator on this we could see those replacement females well over three thousand dollars and i think that's kind of what you're saying yep that's exactly what i'm saying i the the math just doesn't the the best value right now in the in the first quarter of 2024 the best ca- the best value in the entire beef system beef system is a young bred female or you know one shortly in a few months are going to be a female with a calf inside that no matter what she's costing she's well ahead of ev- everything else because you know when you're when you're selling calves for 15 to 1700 dollars a head and you know old rule of thumb is two of them to pay for a for a female well that's that's three thousand to thirty four hundred dollars for a for a a young bred cow and fellas we ain't selling them for that Mm -hmm. you can buy them for 500 to a thousand dollars cheaper than that and pretty much have your pick 
of what you want. And I just think there's there's a ton of value there to be had. And it but it, it clearly shows the upside potential that is there and what and what will come in that market once it starts. Yeah, I think so. The one key thing in that bread heifer calculator, and I think this is something for people to really consider, is your cost to carry that animal. And if you're going to put a lot yeah. to carry that, if it if, if you have a lot of cost in that animal or it takes a lot of hay to feed those animals and and various things of that nature, then you that's something to think about. That's uh, when we start talking about how many calves it takes to pay off a cow. Okay, we've kind of wrapped up through the number uh, we'll kind of wrap up our conversation here today, Clint, as we talk about the, the length of this cycle. Uh, when we look at this, I know with cattle facts, they break this down into a rebuilding phase from now till 2025. And then 26, they call an exhaustion phase where they see cattle prices start to peak and then maybe bit a decline a little bit from 2006 to 2028. And then 2028, the sell off as prices decline. Is that kind of what you're feeling? Or, I mean, I, again, this is kind of like pin and jello to a tree a bit but uh, what do you think <laughs> well you know if if you walk through basic cowboy math you, you've got a heifer calf born this spring she's going to be weaned this fall and bred next year if you retain her as a female she calves the next spring and the following spring she delivers the first calf to the pins that would start to be an additive to the cow numbers mm-hmm so, I mean, you're a, you're, you know, you, you put that into time frame wise and yeah, you're, you're talking three and four years before we legitimately start to rebuild some of these numbers. And so we're 2024, they're talking 2028. I, I absolutely can see that. Mm-hmm. And for every year that we don't have retention, I think we're pushing that out another year just because it, it takes that long for the cattle cycle to do that. And the, the wonderful thing for those of us that own the cattle in between is every year once we start into the retention, we're pulling that many more off of the, off of the numbers that are in the feed yard. Because, you know, right now, if you look at the immediate numbers and, and our, our pens are pretty full, well, why are they full? Because all them heifers are there. There was no heifer retention. So, you know, if we start retaining heifers this year, we're going to be short of cattle in next spring. And, and that's, you know, that's all going to trickle and feed into the, the increase in the price in the short run once that starts and it, it won't it won't be equal everywhere you know regions are going to be different as the expansion and contraction but you know in general there'll be a trend line to move that way once it starts and i i just see a ton of profitability over the course of the next i'm going to say three to six years and i think i would be 95 percent correct in projecting that <laughs> okay. i just think this is going to be you know some of the extended long term as long as we keep our exports humming and, you know, we don't run into to an external issue or, or a, you know, some kind of a internal animal health issue. I just see a ton of profitability in front of us here. You bet. All right. Well, Clint, that's a good way to wrap it up. I appreciate you taking the time. You're on the road. Appreciate you stopping in and, jo- and joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, Justin. You bet. And again, that's Mr. Clint Berry joining us here today on the program, a marketing rep for Superior Livestock. I always appreciate his insight in this as we talk about this is commentary in this market mainly due to the fact of the amount of cattle that he represents on an annual basis and the many years that he's been doing it in addition he owns cattle himself so there's uh, multiple facets that he's looking at that and his insight is also very valuable you know as we look ahead we see these next several years knowing that there's a lot of positives uh, ahead for us and i think uh, at the same time there's also times where we just need to make sure we don't get our skis too out and far in front of us in some of this as well and be smart with what we're doing and I think uh, the slowness that we've seen in some of the rebuilding of the cattle herd, I think, is shows that. I think folks are a little bit cautious about doing this, knowing that, the, that there is an upside to this market happening that's going to be happening in the next several years. But I think at the same time, with some of the outside factors, as Clint was talking about with interest rates, and then also some of the years that we've had in the past several years that have been kind of tough, whether it's been drought years or high hay prices or various things, digging out of that has been something that we've been has been happening for a lot of us. And I know I'm raising my hand on that one as well. Well, stay with us. Coming up after the break. Dr. Travis White with the Saskatoon Colostrum Company will be joining us as we talk about the importance of that liquid gold that comes out of the bags of those new mamas each and every year. And we're going to be talking about the different situations that arise with cow-calf operations. When should you replace colostrum? When should you instead be supplementing colostrum? We're going to talk about those kinds of things when we return here on the Working Ranch Radio Show.
Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. No doubt for a lot of us that are cow-calf operations, we've been in those situations where we have a calf that's struggling to make it through. Maybe the mama died or something happened. Maybe there was stress during the birthing process, various different things that could have happened. And it is important that that calf gets a good start. Today, joining us here to talk a little bit more about that is Dr. Travis White, who's the Director of Veterinary Technical Services for the Saskatoon Colostrum Company. And Dr. White, thanks for joining us here today on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. You know, as we were talking a little bit before we went on air, I had shared with you some of the elements that we're dealing with on our ranch and just realizing and backing up a little bit, being a little bit retrospective in our own operation. One of the things that we're really focusing on is that initial gut health. And with some of these calves, it doesn't start right for them. And that could lead to things way down the road. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it comes down to gut health and then the immunoglobulin that protects these calves against all the pathogens that they come into contact with. Right. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you, you know, unlike you and I, when we're born, we're born with a full complement of, of the immune factors that we need. Uh, cattle or ruminants are different. They're born with a completely naive immune system. So the only way they get any immunity is through the ingestion of colostrum. Now, we know that if they don't get enough colostrum, we have things like, uh, you know, they're nine and a half times more likely to become sick. They're about five and a half times more likely to die prior to weaning. But like you said, that that gut health is also super important. And so colostrum has, you know, over 250 bioactive compounds that, that are found naturally in colostrum. And a lot of those go to stimulate the gut development. So things like epidermal-like growth factor and insulin-like growth factor, that all stimulates that gut villi to grow and that animal that becomes more efficient at digesting nutrients. Then you think about the the microbiome, right, of the of the animal. And and we're just we're just starting to scratch the surface on the importance of the microbiome. But um, you know, colostrum has over 40 all natural uh prebiotics that feed that good gut bacteria. And so as we're trying to get that calf to develop uh, it, it's gut in kind of a natural way, colostrum becomes super important to to stimulate all that. Mm-hmm. You know, several years ago, uh, we didn't really have as many choices as we see today or products that are out there. There's been a lot of advancement made in colostrum supplements that are available to us as ranchers. And one of the things that I, as a question is, is somebody's out there and they're thinking, well, I've got this old cow. I kept some of her colostrum back and that's probably fine to have it in the freezer. But boy, the advancements made today in colostrum supplement is miles ahead of where we were 15, 10, 15, 20 years ago, isn't it? It is. And, and, and you know, keeping around some na- uh, natural colostrum isn't necessarily a bad thing. The thing I I, I caution producers on is, as I go around the country doing meetings, you know, one of the things I often ask beef producers is, where do you get colostrum? If, if you've got a calf that you you have born and it, it needs colostrum, where are you getting it? And oftentimes, depending on the region that they're in, they're getting it from like a little local dairy or something that they're neighbors with. And I caution them from doing that because, you know, one of the things that we deal with in the dairy industry is Yoni's disease is extremely prevalent in in the dairy industry, and we're pretty much guaranteeing that we're going to bring Yoni's disease into our beef herd if we're using colostrum from a source like that. So, I mean, if you're if you're milking colostrum from an older beef cow that you know a calf passed away or something, and you're keeping that, that's fine. But I would caution producers from getting it from a local dairy. But like you said, the advancements in colostrum have come light years. You know, it used to be. A lot of the colostrums we had were what we call serum-based colostrums. So they were more or less blood serum mixed with milk replacer. Um, then they started using some colostrol antibodies, but again, still mixed with with some milk replacer to kind of recreate that. But, you know, cows have been making colostrum in a perfect form for millennia. <laughs> and uh, so that's our, kind of our philosophy is we, we think whole bovine colostrum, nothing added, nothing taken away is the best form. And so that's kind of the game we play in. We collect from uh, over a million cows worldwide. And all we really do, we don't manufacture colostrum at all. The cow manufactures it for us. All we really do is standardize it, heat treat it to kill all the pathogens, and then dry it down and ship it out to you, the producer. 
as I was researching this a little bit, one of the things as I, you guys address a little bit is when should you look at, at replacing colostrum? When, when should that happen? There's a lot of different factors that can happen. We've all been out there, whether it's a cow that's had a, had a calf, it's backwards and it had a stress uh, coming out of the cow, uh, yeah. to orphans, to when we have extreme cold times and, and then even twins and, and, and then calves born at night. There's a lot of different factors in there that, boy, I think everybody just changed checked every one of those boxes off that I just said. And in some ways I hadn't really went through some of that, especially on things like a calf that's been stressed at, at birth. That's something you yeah. know, I didn't really think about that, maybe helping them out a little bit. Definitely twins, you can see that, but that's something really to, to think about those scenarios when it's useful to, to maybe grab that off the shelf and use it. Yeah. So, so that, yeah, there's a few scenarios there that, that you brought up that, and so oftentimes we're talking about replacement versus supplement, you know, so when do I replace versus when do I supplement a calf? And so you brought up orphans. We all know and love the yeah, orphan yeah. dies, whatever, <laughs> uh, um, that, that we know that's a calf that we have to deliver some colostrum mm-hmm. to. It's just not going to have the opportunity to nurse from mom. Um, and then you bring up things like, like dystocia. So we, yeah. we know that calves born via stress. So via dystocia, whether it's a pulled calf or C-section or whatever, their ability to absorb colostrum drops by about 35%. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to deliver more colostrum, more high quality colostrum to that calf in a shorter period of time, just to get them to achieve passive transfer. And then you got things like, you know, still maybe that dystocia calf, but those night calvings where you go out, you pull the calf, it's looking like it's a little slow. We're not sure if it's going to get up. Last thing you want to do is try to get that calf up and nursing mom. uh, You want to go to, the house and get a couple hours sleep before you have to come out and check calves again. And so that's another opportunity where uh, maybe replacing that Mm -hmm. calf with some colostrum is, is beneficial. And then you brought up twins. We, we never know which twin is going to be more vigorous. Yeah. And so uh, replacing both of those twins oftentimes is the best measure, at least with one dose of colostrum. Then we know that uh, both of them had, had an adequate amount. And so we, we have a decision tree, you know, that, we utilize, but our, our ultimate goal is our, we want that calf up and nursing vigorously and well bonded with the dam within two hours. So if that doesn't occur, that's kind of our first checkpoint. So if the calf isn't up and nursing within two hours, then we deliver a dose of colostrum to that calf. Then our second checkpoint is kind of six to eight hours later. And so six to eight hours later, again, hopefully that calf is now up nursing well bonded with the dam and we, we can go on and not worry about that calf anymore. But if that calf is still not up and nursing, then we'd provide a second dose of colostrum to that calf at that point. Mm-hmm. And then when when we start talking about supplementation, then that really comes down to a volume issue, right? So yeah. there are some animals that are just notoriously low on colostrum. Those would be first calf heifers. So, mm-hmm. you know, oftentimes I hear producers say, well, well, I never keep replacements out of my first calf heifers because they are smaller, they're you know, they, they never grow quite as good. And a lot of that can be because a lot of a high percentage of those may be failing passive transfer or low on the passive transfer scale. And so supplementing those calves born to first calf heifers can really promote some growth benefits out of those calves. And then if you've got a cow with a history of weaning a light calf or a calf that uh, developed some pneumonia, uh, maybe a calf that scoured. Again, a lot of times we think of that as you know, they came into contact with some pathogen, right? Yeah. But oftentimes that can go all the way back to just, they had poor quality colostrum and they're more vulnerable to those things. Um, you know, why does this calf get scours, but the rest of his buddies don't? Mm-hmm. Well, he may be born to a first calf heifer. Or again, that cow may have a, a history of light, weaning a light calf and just has a history of poor quality colostrum. Yeah, that's for sure. And and I, as you're talking through all that, I'm just thinking, boy, it's so important, uh, just like a house. I mean, you got to start with a good foundation and not, this really gets back to that. And if there's a shadow of a doubt, especially with where calf prices are, it's better to be safe than sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. Just pull that trigger, you know, and, and again, uh, oftentimes we get the kind of the pushback that, well, it's, it's expensive to do that. And I couldn't agree more, you know, I'm as a rancher, we're trying to, to manage our costs and whatnot, but uh, you know, what's a $30 bill in a potentially $1,500 calf, you know, it's pretty small change. And then, you know, you look at, especially your heifers, replacement heifers that you're looking to keep back. If a calf fails passive transfer, that heifer, and she, 
was potentially a heifer you're going to keep. You know, she could be 30 days later in her first service or mm-hmm. or first calving, if you will, uh, than than the other heifers that got adequate passive transfer. They, you know, they grow at about two thirds the rate of their counterparts and their feed efficiencies reduced by about 50%. So you start talking about the commodity prices yeah. and everything else, you know, to have an animal that grows at two thirds the rate and have has a feed efficiency that's reduced by 50%. That's a pretty big cost. And we can afford to put some some dollars into them on day one. Yeah. Well, I told you when we got to the very end here, I, I, I did have some specific product questions for you. Uh, Saskatoon Colostrum Company, you'll see their products, SCCL, if you're, if you're looking out there for products. But this is one of the things that I'll tell you, it's kind of a head scratcher. I look there and like, well, which one do I get? How do I know which one I need to be looking at here? Yeah, and, and and it is pretty confusing. I think just within our company alone, we have you know our we have our house brands, and then we have well over twenty private labels yeah. that we do for other companies. You know, so again, we're we're big on whole bovine colostrum. So it, in our opinion, it doesn't really matter as long as you're you're buying something that's whole bovine colostrum doesn't have an ingredient list, uh, something like that. So you know, grab the package off the shelf, flip it over. If there's an ingredient list there, it's something you want to kind of walk away from if they if you can't find an ingredient list then that tells you that it's whole bovine colostrum and maybe we can uh, go ahead and and uh, utilize that product we'd love for you to use our products and so look for the little canadian maple leaf on there and so like for example if you go into a tractor supply or something mm-hmm. like that uh, we have a brand in there called colostrix okay and so colostrix is something that we may that we produce um, and so again, look for that little Canadian label on there. Um, and then you'll know that it's one of the Saskatoon products. If you're going through your vet clinic, uh, you know, a lot of times they're going to have a product called vet one, uh, or just like mom and, and both of those are great. So, um, there's no, I wouldn't say there's one product that we manufacture that's better than another one. They're all whole, but whole bovine colostrum, okay. each one. Each of the products has uh, something a little bit different about it. So like we we have a in-house product called High Cal. It's a little higher in fat. Colostrum 200 is a 200 dose, highest concentration of IgG on the market. It's really considered the true replacer on the market. Okay. But yeah, just look for that little Canadian maple leaf and make sure there's no ingredient list. Okay. All right. Well, the website is sccl.com if they want to find out more information about Saskatoon Colostrum Company and the products they offer out there. Dr. White, appreciate you taking the time. I know you're busy. You were telling me before we went on air, you spend 200 and some days on the road. So I appreciate you taking the time out here on a day that you're home. I appreciate it. Thank you. (laughs) You bet. We'll talk to you later. Right. And again, that was Dr. Travis White, Director of Veterinary Technical Services for the Saskatoon Colostrum Company. Again, that website, should you want more information or to research the products that they have, you can go to it at sccl.com. Well, stay with us. Coming up after the break, the Captain Tim O'Byrne, publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine, will be in for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. And we'll also hear from meteorologist Don Day with a look at the long-term weather we're going to be looking as far out as march what's he have to say about that well stay with us we'll find out when we come back on the working ranch radio show Fascinated by our wild weather? Now you can learn, appreciate, and understand the weather in your own backyard with the new Tropo Rain Gauge. Having achieved the highest rating of any product reviewed by the weatherstationexperts.com, the Tropo boasts rugged durability, impeccable accuracy, and precision to the hundredth of an inch. Visit MeasureRain.com to order a Tropo today and use code RAINDAY, that's R-A-I-N-D-A-Y, for free shipping and 10% off. Go to Measure Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Working Ranch, Radio Land. Fear not, winter's almost over to most of us. There'll be bugs chasing us around here pretty quick, and we'll be opening up the gates to the branding trap here soon enough. So let's just hang out and get these calves on the ground. And uh, I, I want to tell you folks about a couple of things that I did see at the Calicon trade show in Orlando a couple of weeks ago. One product service is called M Genesis, EM Genesis. And they've developed software that will very, very accurately grade uh, embryos and kind of take a lot of the guesswork out of which ones are going to be 
viable and which ones will be terminal. It's cool how they do it. Check them out online, M Genesis, and um, they they actually develop software that will take a 30 second video clip off your phone through the electron microscope and run it through a series of algorithms and they will tell you uh, what's what to expect out of the embryo. Fantastic deal. The next one was Envu, E-N-V-U, and they have a software based on satellite imagery that shows your pasture in um, several years back too. So, it, you know, they're, they're dealing with old archived images that will tell them where the weed uh, populations are you know, most important in your pasture to hit them, when to hit them, what kind of success rate you're getting. It's just a really awesome platform. So check them both out, M Genesis and N View. Back to you in the studio, Justin. All right. Thanks, Captain. As always, a lot of new and innovative things so that you can see at these trade shows. That's one of the appealing parts of going to some of these events is just seeing what's all new in the industry out there and appreciate the captain sharing with us some of the things that he saw down at CattleCon 24 that took place in Orlando. Well, as we switch gears a bit now and turn towards our weather, meteorologist Don Day is joining us as we take a look at that long-term weather. And Don, as we are here find ourselves it just seems like every time we're always talking about the next month and it just it's hard it's crazy to see how fast time is moving when we start to look at weather but when we look 30 days out really a lot of indications definitely showing spring type look where it's a, a low pressure system centered from the west really kind of through the center core of the corridor of the country when you look west to east yeah i think uh, if you're a weather watcher and you like to see active weather coast to coast, we're going to be seeing that here uh, really over the next four to six weeks. You had mentioned, you know, the storms wanting to go west, east across the center part of the country. And that's kind of what we're seeing. Uh, we have a developing pattern out in the Pacific that is going to be producing a lot of storms and they're going to want to enter the, the Pacific Northwest, Central California, then basically go west, to east across the USA. And, mm -hmm. You sort of expect that this time of year. You usually see the pattern get a little more stormy. That combined with the fact that there's still a lot of cold air up north should make for uh, a lot of weather. I mean, over the past week, we had pretty good snowstorm in the northeast. Uh, they're experiencing another little wave of snow. Uh, and we're, we're going to see more rain and snow into California. We're also going to see a, a very active pattern across the central high plains and Rockies as well. So there's going to be active weather and it's not going to be boring. That's for sure. Yeah. When, when we look at temperature wise with, with all of this, of course, when we start getting into the spring of the year, colder is kind of better because that usually indicates moisture. That is that what you're seeing? Yeah. One thing I think we're going to see is that with the Pacific ratcheting up, you just get more Pacific air into the U S and less Canadian air. So you're generally going to be looking at temperatures that are going to be colder in the storms, but not terribly cold. Mm -hmm. I think the Great Lakes, the northeastern part of the United States is probably the most susceptible to getting some Arctic shots still. But the temperature trends don't look that cold. But if you're cloudy and wet, it's still going to be pretty chilly. And I think that's what we're going to see, especially in the far west. OK. All right. Well, Don, appreciate you stopping in and joining us with a look at our long term weather. Thanks for having me. And you can tune in each and every morning and follow Don Day as he tracks our weather across the country. Dayweather.com is the link to his website. Stay with us. We'll put a wrap on this week's show when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Coming up next week, pleased to have back with us attorney Dal Houston out of Oklahoma joining us here on the program. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranchers. You can get your subscription started pretty easy by going to workingranchmag.com. My email address is justin.workingranch at gmail.com. Thanks for joining us. I'm Justin Mills. And until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long.